Hi, um, my name is Jayon Lim, and today I'll be I'll talk about uh, mapping with fixed wing autonomy in the mountains. Um, so, a quick introduction of myself: I come from uh, ETH Zurich uh, and uh, in the Autonomous Systems Lab, which focuses on uh, novel robotics concepts, uh, mainly rotary wings uh, these days, aerial manipulation, uh, long endurance fixed wing vehicles. Uh, um, novel perceptions pipelines and uh, mobile manipulation. So I, I would like to um, focus on uh, the use case of using drones as an information gathering device. So while um, controlling drones may, the normal workflow may consist of commanding waypoints, uh, making sure that the vehicle follows specific paths, but the end user actually doesn't care what kind of um, drone you're flying or what kind of path you're flying, the end user actually cares about um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the sensor data you're actually acquiring. So essentially drones are um, a flying sensor payload. Um, so uh, in this talk, I, I'll try to uh, walk you through what I'm trying to do uh, with um, monitoring avalanches with um, autonomous fixed wing vehicles. Um, I think this, uh, while the specific avalanche use case might not be interesting for everyone, I think it opens up a lot of uh, novel ideas on like what an autonomous systems looks like and um, how, how you want to proceed also in the PX4 autopilot. Um, so uh, Switzerland is known for the beautiful mountains uh, with the steep terrain and um, with the high altitude, there's not much trees, so you have very nice snow, and uh, it's very nice to ski. However, uh, because of this reason, um, there can be avalanches, and this can be potentially a bit dangerous. So when I talk about avalanches, people uh, think about these very dynamic events, where uh, dramatic events, where um, uh, 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 very quick, uh, the avalanche is engulfing everything on its way, and there's snow uh, blowing around. But avalanches actually come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. On the right side, you actually see an avalanche that already has gone down. Um, and yeah, in case you couldn't spot it, I put the outline of the avalanche. Um, it can be actually quite scary if you can get caught into one. So, um, uh, when, when skiers actually get caught in avalanches, um, you actually get buried inside the snow and um, uh, you won't be able to move because of the weight of the snow. So somebody actually needs to dig you out. Um, avalanches are not only dangerous for uh, skiers um, uh, because Switzerland is quite uh, um, populated close to these mountains. Um, avalanches can be quite um, destructive to uh, roads or buildings and infrastructure. Um, this is actually from 2019, where an, uh, near a mountain called Santis, where an avalanche came down close to the resort and actually um, uh, damaged uh, part of the building. And um, this ac avalanche is actually account for the biggest, uh, most hazardous um, natural hazard in Switzerland, accounting for about 200 deaths. deaths for the last 10 years. And so the Snow and Research Institute um, in Switzerland, SLF, uh, maintains an avalanche bulletin to closely monitor these um, uh, avalanches and inform people um, around the region to uh, help them make decisions on um, the activities they're going to do. And the avalanches are um, controlled by these preventive measures. Um, Left side is a snow bridge, which prevents um, snow for, uh, avalanches from uh, sliding down the slope. Or on the right side, you can see these poles where they keep charges, so you can actually have uh, controlled avalanches before you have too much uh, snow deposits developing. Um, and to monitor these avalanches, um, the area, mountain ranges are quite uh, there are, are a lot of sensor stations that are actually automatically trying to monitor uh, snow depths and um, 
to, to predict these uh, risks for avalanches. But um, it is quite essential for actually people going out in the field, um, whether it's before the avalanche and they want to acquire data, or it's after the avalanche, to keep track of how much avalanche activity they are, there is um, so that they can use this data um, uh, for future infrastructure projects. And th they also extensively use drones, but um, it is still people going out close to where the avalanche happened, uh, throwing the drone, uh, acquiring data. And um, it is actually a huge problem that avalanches are, can have, are very in, at uh, very inaccessible areas and um, it can get it quite dangerous in some cases. Um, so the problem is that we have a very large area to monitor. Um, we can't cover the whole area with, um, with uh, sensors. Um, so we would like to use this kind of um, autonomous UAVs to try to monitor the environment. The problem is that we don't know, we, there is no prior knowledge of where the avalanche is before you actually start the mission. Um, and so that you can't carefully plan um, surveys or uh, waypoints uh, prior to the mission because you actually don't know where the avalanche is. And the terrain is actually quite challenging to navigate. Um, so um, while trying to fix this problem with like careful planning, we can actually try to give more context to the autonomous vehicle uh, to the vehicle so that it can autonomously make decisions uh, more smartly to, to actually optimize on acquiring these information that we actually care about rather than trying to uh, plan precise waypoints on guiding the vehicle that potentially may or may not uh, result in actually better data. So this is uh, the Aval Mapper project which I'm focusing on. Um, the grand vision, uh, the the sort of storyline would be like a scientific domain expert gives sort of the context to the vehicle uh, on possibly some potential avalanche sites. Uh, the vehicle sh should be able to um, optimize on which sites it's going to visit, um, depending on uh, the vehicle range of the vehicle, or maybe even more data such as um, uh, the avalanche history. And then the vehicle goes out and detects the avalanche autonom autonomously and uh, maps the avalanche. And then also repeats this um, decision making process to select which um, avalanche sites to map and then tries to come back. So the project can be broken into multiple components such as um, navigating the environment, detecting the avalanche, um, then mapping the avalanche and then the actual hardware that can fly in these challenging terrain. Uh, in this talk, I would like to focus on uh, two main problems, which is the navigation problem and the mapping problem. Um, and first, uh, for the mapping problem, the reason this, is, uh, this problem is challenging is that um, the, the alpine terrain, uh, with fixing vehicles, you're normally constrained with the minimum turning radius or climb rates. And, uh, in these mountainous terrain, the terrain can actually change more quickly than your vehicle can actually, your vehicle dynamics. So the vehicle can actually end up in these inevitable collision states where once you're inside this state, whatever the actions the vehicle can make, the vehicle will still end up in a collision. And it, it's very hard for an operator to figure out whether the vehicle will enter in the state or not. So. Um, some kind of autonomous decision making is essential to avoid these states. And in Switzerland in particular, um, the, the regulations of extended beyond line of sights um, constrain you with the maximum altitude vertically from the terrain, which in case of a steep terrain, it actually narrows down uh, the traversable space the vehicle can actually use. So um, you actually need some kind of uh, a, a path uh, to actually safely navigate these uh, tight spaces. Also, uh, with fixed wing vehicles, the, um, the range of the vehicle is usually can go easily over 100 kilometers, which results in like the, the environment being very large. And it might result be that um, 
the map might be too big for these computationally constrained um, systems. You might say, why not just reduce the resolution of the map? Um, this normally results in, uh, when the terrain is complex, um, a very conservative map representation that constrains even further to, uh, uh, to for in terms of space that you can actually navigate. So this is what the system uh, we came up looks like. Um, the vehicle can uh, navigate safely around terrain while uh, so satisfying minimum and maximum altitude constraints. Um, and on the right side, you can see sort of the ground operator UI where um, you have Q ground control that talks to the flight stack directly as, a, as the uh, main interface. And on the left side, you see the um, interface that you can interact with the autonomy stack. Um, so in, in order to safely navigate the environment, you actually need to, uh, in, in order to actually um, check inevitable collision states, you actually need to check uh, infinite horizon trajectories. Um, the reason is that for on the right side, you can see, I would like, I like to say, uh, uh, an airplane cor corridor example where in a corridor, if you have a limited horizon, you, you can evaluate your path and it might look like it's collision free, but if your corridor ends up as a dead end, um, you might uh, have these cases where um, the vehicle ends up in a collision. Um, a smart way to uh, fix this problem is you can have periodic trajectories, uh, paths such as um, the circle path at the end where if, if you evaluate the collision states for the uh, periodic path, you can actually evaluate collisions for an infinite horizon path. So on the left side, you see um, a, 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 a sort of a receding horizon manner, the vehicle looking for safe states uh, to navigate. Um, however, um, because the terrain is complex, the vehicle can actually end up in these um, sort of local minimas where while it's trying to go reach the goal, it uh, ends up in these small pockets where the vehicle actually gets stuck and um, it's not very straightforward how it can come out of, of these um, local minimas. So you actually need some kind of a, a global path planning framework where um, it can find a globally feasible path to actually reach the goal point. Um, this, it, you can, on the left side, you can see uh, the path generated by a Dubin's RT star planner uh, from uh, Philip Oetschagen and uh, Florian Ackerman. And um, you can, as, as you can see, as the vehicle dynamics is more constrained with a larger minimum radius, the vehicle actually needs to plan much more ahead, taking detours to, in order to safely navigate um, to the goal position. On the right side, you can see the planner being implemented in a software in the loop simulation, uh, tracking the path and replanning as it goes. We can scale this up to much more larger environments. So uh, you can see that the vehicle can safely navigate from uh, valley to valley. Um, uh, approximately the left environment, it's about 15 kilometers of um, distance uh, on each side. And this is, um, and uh, to ensure like these sort of integrations are correct, um, it is very helpful to actually test these in the software in the loop simulation framework of PX4. So the autonomy stack and the ground control station actually does not know whether the vehicle is simulated or it is a real vehicle. Um, so you can actually check all the operation procedures or uh, um, try to find corner cases before you even try to do these kind of say, uh, risky experiments. So now that we have uh, some idea on like what the challenges are and how we can navigate these uh, alpine environments. I'd like to move on to how we can map the avalanche when we are able to detect them. So normally, um, the normal workflow of mapping is generating a lawnmower pattern or a coverage pattern um, uh, that actually is guaranteed to cover the environment. Um, however, in steep terrain, this is extremely challenging. And 
so that since the vehicle is constrained with climb rates and it has to turn um, uh, at the end of each grid pattern. And also, uh, because the terrain is complex, the ground sample distance become very inconsistent. Um, so as you can see, this is uh, um, a PX4 uh, mission being executed. Uh, and um, the colors indicate how much the surface has been actually uh, observed. And uh, as you can see, it is a, a very different of what you normally expect um, due to the uh, terrain geometry and the uh, climb rate being uh, constrained at the vehicle. The, 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 the distance to the terrain varies a lot. And this actually compromises the quality of the reconstruction that you're making. Um, also, uh, in these alpine environments, the terrain actually can induce a lot of uh, um, wind. And this, for fixed wing vehicles, you normally don't have a gimbal mounted on your vehicle. Um, and then this, ac this can actually um, compromise your results since like, the overlap will be different as you predicted. And this is very hard to control because in terms of wind, you would not be able to predict it until you're actually there. However, these lawnmower patterns, it's uh, normally pre-planned. -pre so the only way to find out is actually come back and process the whole image and realize um, that the reconstruction didn't work. And, um, and normally, with avalanches, the weather window is so small that um, it's, if it's snowed in between, the whole mapping results are useless, and then you have to there's no way you can map the avalanche again. And the biggest challenge is that um, you actually have to, uh, so, so we, we actually want to try to fight these um, problems by making decisions online. However, um, the photogrammetry pipeline is an offline process running on high resolution images, which is very hard to predict. Um, uh, and the decisions can only be on be made online. However, if you try to make sort of a proxy online reconstruction, um, it is very hard to correlate the online reconstruction results with the offline photogrammetry results since uh, the, the features that are being used might be actually different. Um, so in order to solve this problem, we actually want to try to have an active mapping approach where um, the vehicle is able to react to these sort of um, disturbances and uh, try and, and map the avalanche until we actually reach a certain quality as fast as you can. So to do this, um, uh, I try to use a concept called fish information. So you actually quantify uh, information using your measurement model. So in our case, cameras are a bearing sensor. So uh, we assume that our measurements are bearing vectors of landmarks across the surface. And then we can actually try to estimate what, you, what, what we call a kramer rao bound, which is the um, minimum variance that can be achieved for a, an optimal estimator to estimate the parameter. And the parameter in this case is the position of the landmark, which represents the surface. Um, so this is the uh, active mapping working, trying to map an avalanche. Um, so you can see that it, it's, uh, it, it keeps track of um, the, the viewpoints and then plans greedily for the next maneuver to, to actually uh, cover the environment um, uh, with, with a certain quality threshold. And if you compare and as you can see, if you compare it with normal surveys, you, you can see that it can actually generate uh, more complete maps much faster while having a competitive precision of the reconstruction. Um, what's kind of cool if you use these measurement model is that um, you can actually tell the planner how, how accurate your, your um, bearing measurements are going to be, which is um, your actually image resolution. So, so the, the planner actually um, 
behaves differently depending on what kind of image sensor you have. So for example, on the left, you have a very, very low resolution camera. So the, it, the, using the metrics, it actually tries to uh, trade off coverage um, to, for reconstruction. So it, it's slowly um, uh, sort of uh, uh, spreading out the, the covered areas. Well, if you have a higher resolution image, it actually tries to cover the, the environment at once um, so that you can co um, cover the environment faster with the same quality. And so this is all great, but um, actually, so in order to, rip the, the surface is actually represented by the positions of the landmark, which is quite computationally expensive to evaluate. So to actually be able to deploy this online, we need an approximate uh, approach. Um, so for this, I'm using a Monte Carlo tree search, uh, which is a, a anytime graph search algorithm and can actually see that the vehicle is that can cover the environment uh, quite efficiently, even if the terrain is quite complex. And on the right side, you see a preliminary in integration of this planner um, in software in the loop. So the vehicle actually is tracking what the planner is showing. And what's quite cool about this is that um, you generate this kind of feedback loop on, on the viewpoints taken while mapping. So in case the vehicle is disturbed by wind, um, it, it can actually react accordingly. And if you, in case you have a hole, it will try to go back and look, uh, look at what you actually missed. So the next step uh, is to actually try and verify the concept with a real vehicle. So this is what our vehicle looks like. It is based on the Makefly Easy Believer. Um, has a, a, a Pixel 4 and a, um, a companion computer which is running the autonomy stack and is, is equipped with a Sony A7R um, camera. And it has a command and control link um, also on LT and the long range radio so that uh, we can operate safely um, in, in the Alps. So uh, last winter we started trying uh, doing a first flight test. Um, and and yeah. so while the video is running, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. So this is actually the vehicle uh, flying in a valley uh, called Sertig. And on the right side, you actually see the um, uh, path planner generating paths. And the video is being streamed over LTE, and also um, the autonomy stack information is being streamed over LTE. Yeah, that's it from my side. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer, or I'll be around and I'm happy to talk about. Uh, how do you deal with, like, I, I guess, any kind of avoidance, or do you just plan paths that ensure that you stay far enough off the ground? I just know um, it's, uh, I backcountry ski, and a lot of the time you just have very smooth, featureless uh, surfaces that don't really show up well, and they don't really work super well with distance sensors. Um. So the question was uh, whether if, uh, if the homogeneous texture of the snow is a problem. Um, I think that was actually the initial expectation 
um, that this will be a problem, but um, actually snow, uh, at least like not when you're on flat terrain, snow has actually quite some texture because of the, snow, uh, the wind and the kind of snow moving around. And also, um, if your terrain is complex enough, these sort of undulations introduce shadows, which is actually quite helpful for the photogrammetry pipeline. So this was not too much of a problem, but it is true that if you have very like flat surfaces with snow that uh, was deposited maybe in the same snowfall, you actually might have these problems. Are you doing this with only visual sensors or are you using like altitude monitors and laser rangefinders and stuff like that to keep you off the ground? Uh, so do you mean for the mapping or for the navigation? Uh, I guess for, for the navigation primarily. Ah, um, sorry. So yes, I think I didn't mention. Um, so the navigation is done on a digital elevation map because we actually know uh, prior where we are going to fly and normally you have very good prior knowledge of what the terrain looks like. So it's based on an elevation map. Um, the only problem is that you don't actually know how high the snow is going to be or like for example if you have trees but this can be dealt with with uh, having margins. Um, so that's why the minimum altitude um, is defined to actually avoid these kind of problems. Cool, thank you. So speaking of altitude, what's the minimum altitude you fly on close to the terrain? Um, so I, I actually, um, so the maximum is 150 meters and then the minimum I use uh, 50, but um, not just vertically, but actually like the distance to the terrain, the minimum distance to the terrain. So I generate a surface um, before flying where you calculate the surface that has the distance to the terrain as 50 meters, and then try to plan safe paths inside. And then um, did you never have issues with the GPS actually reflecting on the terrain? Um, not really. I, I, I think I've never experienced this, um, but probably could be, <laughs> um, yes, but I guess you would see it in the log where the GPS bounces around in this case, and I think this was either the PX4 EKF is good enough to reject these or um, yes. Uh, we have one question here on the chat. Uh, it says, nice talk. How does the vehicle deal with low battery as it makes the maps? Um, I think the answer is, is currently does not because it's actually trying uh, more of an implementation to um, evaluate the, the algorithm. Um, and normally we fly on, on a slope that doesn't have uh, obstruction. So you, we can always just safely uh, return to the ground station if you just move away from the terrain. Yes, hi. I was not paying attention to QGC as you had it up, but are you commanding the UAV in offboard mode or act are you actually planning out and going into mission mode to map these out? Um, I'm actually using offboard mode. Um, and so that was one of the things um, uh, that needed to be done was to actually make allow, make the enable the vehicle to track paths uh, with curvatures. The Dublin's Dublin's RRT uh, algorithm that you were showing up there and commanding in offboard mode. Yes, yeah, so the Dublin's RRT is more of a path planning algorithm, um, mm -hmm. which uh, respects the minimum curvature. So it is, it's because Dublin's path is if you have two points the Minimum distance consists of um, arcs with the minimum radius and straight lines. So it actually plans uh, the shortest distance path with assuming that you're 
vehicle is a Dubin's airplane. And then the path tracking um, is done with uh, NPFG, uh, which, is a, which is actually part of upstream now. Thank you very much.